the GPG one? Yeah. No, the GPG one is my online lecture because, you know, we missed Monday last week. So it's a replacement, you know, to the actual in-class meeting. No, you'll be fine. You, you'll be fine, you know. There, there's a lesson today that you will have to do with GPG. I don't think it will interfere. I don't think it will interfere with the lesson. So did you play around a little bit with it with GPG? Okay, but well that's good. <clears throat> I don't really need that screen to just get turned on by itself. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I have a lot of stuff on this screen here. too much stuff open. So how many people had a chance to check out the uh, the GPG YouTube uh, online lecture thing. Some of you, okay. So is it okay as a replacement for an actual lecture, or yeah. does I like it sort of works? Okay. Yeah. I seldom teach hybrid or hot online classes, so most of the time I have you know you know full face to face you know contact with students. This is one of the very few times when I have a you know hybrid class. <coughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and get to this class. You know, we, we have two lessons today. You know, one is for the GPG stuff, and the other one is for CLAM <coughs> FS or CLAM, CLAM file system. So if you scroll down to topic four, <coughs> the top, the discussion is here. GPG is, you know, over here. But the lesson is in topic five, you know, because I decide, you know, since I put the focus on topic five, most people will be looking in topic five, and that's why I put the GPG lesson in topic five as well. The GPG one is the longer one. There's another one for CLAM and CLAM file system, which is a shorter one. Uh, if you read the modules, okay, you know, the GPG one doesn't seem too long. I added some additional stuff into the lesson. In other words, the lesson is not really just a lab activity. It also includes additional instructions and additional concepts of GPG. Are there any questions about the general idea <coughs> of GBG or PGP or any type of key pair encryption method? How many, how many people already know what is key pair encryption and how it is applied? Okay, about half the class. Um, I would say about, yeah, about half the class. So I will just go ahead and talk about you know, the concepts behind key pair encryption anyway. Um, just a general discussion because it's not Linux specific for sure. Okay, this part is universal to all operating systems. Okay, let me turn on the lights because for now it doesn't matter what is on the screen. So just turn on the lights here and I'll have uh, some props. Okay, oh. it's really hard for you guys to see the difference. So I'll use you know the white versus the black. Okay, so the two fobs. One is actually not a fob; it's a flashlight. I picked it up from the ground, from the floor. Um, I think two years ago from a Cal Expo. You know, somebody dropped it, and uh, <coughs> I've I've been using it ever since. So pretty cheap, you know, and it works. And the other one is a car, you know, fob that I do, that I'm not driving today, so I can keep pushing it and nothing will happen. <laughs> Worst thing you want to do is you know to remotely unlock your car all the way from here. That would not be good. Okay, so key, key pair encryption is and the name as the name implies, you have two keys. 
Okay, every time you generate a key, you're generating two key, two keys because it comes in a pair. The magic is whatever you lock with one key, you can only unlock using the other key. And it's vice versa. The relationship is symmetric. If I lock with a black key, I can unlock it using the white key. If I lock it with a white key, I can unlock it with the black key. So that's the cool part of uh, key pair encryption. So now what I can do is I can designate one of them as my private key. So I'll designate my you know, white key or what, the little white pop flashway thing as my private <coughs> key. So this one I keep in my pocket. I make sure nobody else has it. And this is what I will call as my public key. As the name implies, can I make copies of this fob and just give it to everybody? Sure, because what, but, but isn't that not so cool? Because if all of you have the black key and one of you encrypt a message, message to send to me and somehow the other person can see that message, doesn't mean that the other person can unlock the message and know exactly what is being sent to me. No, because a black key cannot, cannot unlock messages locked with the black key itself. Okay, so the entire world can use this black key to lock up messages, to encrypt messages that are sent to me, that are being sent to me. But since no one has the white key, they can only see each other's encrypted messages, but not the original, not the, un the, not the deciphered one. And only I have the white key to unlock it. So that's the general idea of key pair encryption, which is pretty easy, okay? <clears throat> okay, so if you do the lesson today, you know, on the GPG-1, the first part is really easy, okay? You just, you know, install GPG, okay? And you also have to install GPM. If you watch the video clip, you will remember why I have to install GPM. Can okay, anyone just kind of mention a little bit why you have to install GPM? Exactly. Without GPM, you know, with all the user interaction, which is still keyboard based, things are not exactly randomized. Okay, so they're fairly predictable. <coughs> so GPM is only there to kind of make things a little bit more random, um, so that you can have you know a more randomized you know key pair. Okay, so this is this is great. Now the next thing is. The next part is not discussed in the notes, so you cannot find it in the notes, but it is in the lesson, so I want to talk about it just a little bit, okay? So let's say um, I receive a message from somebody, okay? Someone sent me a message um, claiming that that person is Obama at whitehouse.gov, okay? Send me a key and say, hey, you know, uh, <coughs> this is my public key. If you want to send me any type of secret messages, you know, use this key to lock up the messages and send it to me, okay? Do we have a problem here? Well, what if I, what if I think that, you know, that's actually the public key of, you know, Obama <coughs> at whitehouse.com and you know, whitehouse.gov and I have some really important message to send to the, to, the, uh, to the president and it has to be encrypted because I don't want anybody else to get a hold of the message. Is there any risk involved yeah, in this? Well, you're not really sure of that person's identity. Exactly. Okay. Just because the public key says the owner of the key is Obama at WhiteHouse.gov does not mean that the owner of the key is actually Obama at WhiteHouse.gov. Now you have all run GPG or have, have, have seen I, you know, in the demonstration run GPG to generate a key pair, right? So I can just as easily enter, you know, you know, Obama at whitehouse.gov as the email address. Right? Yeah. What about the message? What about the email that I received? You know, it has a return address of Obama at whitehouse.gov. You can fake that. Well that's easy to fake, right? I mean that's like it takes it takes two lines of pro code to do it. <clears throat> so that means I cannot trust anything in this message. But what is the danger of actually using that public key to encrypt a message to send it to the real president? I mean, you know, don't you think in the worst case, you know, the real president would get a message because the you know, whitehouse.gov is a is a legit, you know, domain name 
and Obama probably is a domain is, is a, one of the users on that domain name. So that person or that recipient would just get the message, you know, which is encrypted by a, some random public key, and he cannot unlock it. Okay, but that would be the end of the danger, right? I mean, you know, it's just that the message does not get delivered. No. Well, not really. Why is there a problem? Because the other, the person that was maliciously trying to recover that message can now read the message that was intended for the Exactly. So if that person turns out to be working for one of the, I, one of, turn out, turns out to work for the ISP of one of the senators, that person can actually get a hold of the encrypted message. And since that's the, that's the person with the private key, he, can, he or she can unlock the message that was intended for the president. And now you have another case of, guess what? WikiLeak. <laughs> okay? So the question now is, well, you know, since we talk about security, we talk about all the cool things about GPG, and we talk about all the things about you know, how a 1024-bit encryption key is practically uncrackable using you know normal hardware. I mean, the government has got some hardware to do you know, to crack encryption, but for you know you and I, you know that's pretty much as good as locked. So now the pro the problem boils down to trust. Okay, if you just want to encrypt your stuff so that other people cannot see your stuff, then whatever you read in the notes is already done. Okay, because you're the only one who needs to decipher the you know all the, the content. So there's no such thing as a, as a trust relationship. On the other hand, if I want to send somebody an encrypted message, I have to make sure that the public key that I have of that person is, the, is actually a public key from that person, okay? So what GPG does is, you know, it is the same as PGP, you know, basically the, the, it's the same idea. It's called a web of trust, okay? So let's see you know, what, how, how it works. This is something that is not in the notes, and that's why you know, I kind of felt that it's important to talk about it in the class. Okay, so let's say we have you know, user A and user B, okay? <clears throat> user A and user B are colleagues, okay? They, they're right next to each other in terms of cubicles. So they can actually, you know, user A can actually see user B create the GPG you know, key pair, and vice versa. So in other words, A can trust B, and B also trusts <coughs> A, okay? Just because they have, they have physical proximity and they can establish the trust. Yep. Is that okay so far? Okay. So when they trust each other, you can actually send a public key to the other person. In other words, A can export a key, the public key to B, and when B wants to encrypt a message to send back to A, B can basically say, oh, I know who A is, I saw him creating that public key, and I gave him the USB thumb drive to copy the exported file. So the trust relationship can be established. So what B can do is to say, okay, I'll go ahead and sign the public key from you. Okay, when you sign a key from somebody else, you are establishing a trust relationship. Are we doing okay so far with this? And the same thing happens you know, when B exports his or her key to user A, and since you know, user A saw user B exactly typing that command, to creating the file, and use a, use a USB drive to copy the file, the, the relationship can also be established. So A can sign the public key of B and say, yes, you know, I, I verify that this key does belong to user B. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so now let's say you know user A and user B, you know they don't work together anymore. So B is now working at the remote side; they don't really get to see each other anymore. So physically, they don't have a proximity anymore. But the keys do work, okay? You know because the keys are signed, and as long as they do not lose the key, everything is still working fine. Okay. So now B has a new colleague, C. Okay. Now here's the fun part. The fun part is C somehow gets to know A too, okay? And let's say, you know, C, you know, user C wants to send an encrypted message to user A. So here's a quick question. If user C wants to send an encrypted message to user A so that only user A can read the message, whose public key do you think user C requires? C. Nope. 
its age. Okay, user C will require the public key from user A. Okay, so here's the problem. The problem is user C will send an email to user A and say, send me your public key, okay? Export your public key and send it to me so that I can send an encrypted message to you. So user A will reply with a message including the public key, which is not a problem because remember the public key, anybody can see the public key and there's, there's no security risk involved. But the problem is C cannot say that, oh, are we quite sure that this is in fact a public key from user A, can I trust this key? Are, you, are we doing okay so far? So by nature, it, you cannot trust it, right? Yeah, because it, Just because it, it came back from user A doesn't mean that that message was actually sent by user A, and as a result, the key cannot be trusted. But guess what? That key, okay, B also has you know, A's public key, remember that? Because they, they, they talk to each other when they were working right next to each other. And now B and C are right next to each other, so they can establish a physical trust. So what C can do is to say, hey, B, I can trust you because I, my cubicle is right next to you. So B and C can now establish a trust relationship because you know, they can see each other generate the public key and do everything like that. And, but B, remember, B already trusts A. So now the, the, the trust relationship is transitive. In other words, C can trust B and B can trust A. So what happens is B can now export A's public key. When B publishes A's public key, C will have no problem accepting it because C already accepts B as a trusted person. So that's how it works. It's called the web of trust. Okay, and it's relying on you know, the transitive property of trust. If A trusts B and B trusts C, then A can implicitly trust C. So GPG has, an, has a built-in ability to maintain a key ring of all the public keys that you have to deal with. It can also keep track of which key has been signed by whom, implying who can trust whom. So through that relationship, GPG can figure out if you get a new key exported by somebody else, it can automatically determine whether that key can be trusted or not. Because it can check whether the signature can be linked you know, from one person all the way to the person that you have to trust in the end. So this part is not in the notes, but I just felt that this is kind of important because unless you only want to <coughs> encrypt your own files so that nobody else you know, can access your file, if you intend to encrypt something to transmit it to somebody else, you will encounter this problem eventually. So are we doing okay so far with the concept of you know, trusting someone? But what is signing something? <laughs> how, does the, how does signing a key or signing a file, you know, creating a signature, relate to key pair encryption? Is it a whole new, different idea, or is it really the same idea? Just you know, you just you know, fry the other side. <laughs> you just flip it and and turn it over. That's exactly what it is. Okay, so let's 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 go ahead and erase this picture. And I want to talk a little bit about you know what is a signature? How do you sign a key? You know what is the significance of signing a key? And I'll try to use the, the screen as much as I can, so this way I can capture the output in the end. Let's go ahead and turn off the front bank of lights. <coughs> okay, so here we go. And I'll go ahead and just use a text file, so this way you don't need any special files to open this. Okay, okay. encryption. And sign. Now we already talked about encryption, okay? If A wants to send a secret message to B so that only B can see and decipher the content. Okay, so tell me again 
what does A need in order to encrypt a message so that only B can read the actual message? B's public key. Very good. Okay. A uses B's public key to encrypt the message. A uses his or her private key to decipher the encrypted message. So this part is fairly easy. We talked about it already. But the problem is, you know, how do we know for sure that it is the message really came from A? Remember, all you need in order to send an encrypted message to B is B's public key. And who do you think has B's public key? Everybody. Everybody. So when B receives a message that is encrypted using his or her public key, there's no telling whether it really came from user A or not. Is that okay? Okay, so how do we sign a message? That's the next question. Okay. So in this case, we need a protocol signature so that B can be assured the message did come from user A. So how do we do something like this? Any suggestions? Does, has anyone read up on you know, how to sign a message you know, in addition to encryption? Does anyone know what is a digest? Go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> like an MD5 digest is that you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, so you can make sure if, if you have an MD5 digest, it'll create a hash. That hash, if it has a change, you should be able to run the digest on it again and you'll get the same result. With the signing, you're usually going to sign it, but what I'm kind of wondering where you're going here is because usually when you sign something, even when you're sending these messages, you still sign it with a public key, usually. That's right? not, that's actually not true. Okay. You sign with a private you're, you're pretty good, yes. Yeah, you sign with a private key, and then when you check it, you use the public key. So, oh, okay. yeah, so, so you almost got it right. You almost got it right. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at this part here. Okay. We want, you know, to sign a message so that we can authenticate, you know, who actually, you know, wrote the message. <clears throat> So what what we need here is a digest, okay? Okay, a digest is a short bit pattern that is generated from a file of MD size. The MD5 hash is a hash is is a digest, okay? In other words, you take a file of any size Okay, you go through a whole bunch of calculation, which is open-ended. Okay, the, the calculation is already open, the algorithm is known, everybody, everybody knows how to generate an MD5 hash. So you compute a checksum, it's nothing more than really a checksum in the end. And it's not unique, you can have multiple files generating the same MD5 you know, hash, but the chances is pretty slow, pr pretty slim. So it is possible for multiple files to have the same MD5 checksum, but the chances are so slim that most people do not worry about it. Okay. Okay. The algorithm method to compute a digest is known to everyone. In other words, you cannot just use the digest to verify the authenticity of a message. That by itself is not enough. But what we can do is something like this, okay? So user A will use his or her private key to encrypt the digest of a message intended for user B, okay? So this time we are encrypting using a private key. We are not encrypting using a public key. But what, why do we want to do that? Because this time, the focus is not making sure the message cannot be read by anybody else. This time, the, the, the focus is authenticity, okay? Did A really send that message? That's the key, that's the, that's the idea. So in this case, user A will use you know, the, A, you know, the private key of A to encrypt the digest of a message. Not the entire thing, just the digest. <clears throat> user B, receives the message, okay? So user B now has two things to do. 
user D computes the digest like everybody else. Everybody else. In other words, user B will first compute the, you know, the, the actual digest of the message, not including the uh, encrypted digest itself. Okay, the next, next thing user B needs to do is user B uses user A's public key to decipher the encrypted digest. Is that okay so far? The second line is, is, the, is the trick. That's the trick of doing things. Because user B will now have two digests. One digest is computed directly from the body of the message, which can be plain text, can be encrypted, doesn't matter. Okay? But he has another digest. The other digest is the decrypted version of the encrypted digest that gets sent along with the message itself. But that digest was encrypted using A's private key. So B has now you know, A's public key, and then the key pair thing will work, and then, a, and then B, user B will end up with the first digest that A wanted to send. If the two digests you know, match up, then there's good authenticity. If they don't match up, then the message may not be coming from user A. Is that is the concept okay so far? Yep. So like, if you were to copy a public key with someone else, so would that not be Can you say it a little bit louder? The public key is known to the entire world, so that's not a problem. The, the private key is the one that you have to keep as a secret. So using the analogy that I had earlier, okay. So, okay, so, okay, let me just turn on the lights. I know you guys don't, don't like it. Okay, remember, this is my private key. This is the one that I keep in my pocket. So this time, it works the other way around. You guys already have my black key, which is my public key, right? So what I'm doing is I am, this is, let's say this is the digest of the message that I want to send to somebody. So what I would do is I'm using my private key to lock this up, okay? And I keep this, I put this into the same envelope with the body of the message, and that gets sent to the intended re recipient. Is that okay so far? So let's say you know the recipient received you know the message. So I'm looking for more props here. So this is the message, and this is the the, the, the encrypted signature that goes along with the message. If I'm the recipient, I receive these two, two these two components. The message itself can be encrypted, can be plain text. I don't care. Okay, it depends on you know, whether the content really needs to be locked up or not. But here's a little bit of an attachment in addition to the body. This is a MD5 you know, uh, digest that was encrypted using the sender's own private key. Is that okay so far? Now who in the world has that private key? At least you know, when things work the way it's supposed to. Only the sender, right? So that means if I use the public key of the sender, well, can I have a copy of the public key of the sender? The entire world can have a copy of the, of the sender's public key because it's, it's a public key. So if I use the public key of the sender to apply it on this digest, okay, to unlock it, the unlocked checksum turns out to match the content that came along in the same envelope, don't you think I can establish the identity of the sender of this message? That's how signatures work. So when you sign a message, when you sign a key, when you sign something electronically, you are using your own private key to, to lock it up, basically. But since everybody else has your public key, they can all check to see whether the, act the thing was actually signed by you or by someone who's trying to, be pre to pretend to be you because supposedly nobody else has your private key. Is that okay so far? Now, but this is not the end of the whole thing about your know, key pair encryption. Yep. One order step with the digest is that you keep talking. Okay. 
How does that? How did you? Is that another program that generates that, or? Um, yes, there are, there are programs to generate you know different types of you know hashes. You know they are also called hashes or MD5 checksums. You know, but they're basically a fixed bit fixed fixed width bit pattern. So no matter how big the original message is, it's just you know a, a signature. I shouldn't call it signature because that confuses with you know what we are doing here. But it's basically an an ID to so they can double check whether you know that message. And this, you know, checksum matches them or not. So the, it's a checksum. They'll both match. They'll both be the same. Then when they're checked with the key, the one that's encrypted and the one that's not encrypted would be the same. Correct. Okay, but but the problem is, you know, authenticity. Okay. So this, here's a message. Okay, and here's a message. Right. This is the original MD5, mm -hmm. or whatever checksum you want to use. Doesn't matter which algorithm, as long as you know the other party agrees to use the same algorithm, that's fine, okay? Mm -hmm. But the algorithm to go from the message to the MD5 checksum, that's public domain. Everybody can do it. If they know the message, they can generate the MD5 checksum, okay? So what you do is you lock it up, okay? Right. You lock it up, and you lock it up using the sender's private key, okay? Now, the message is, is independent. If you want to lock up the message, you have to use the public key of the recipient. But let's just say that the message itself is fine, okay? Right. It's, it's simple enough that you don't have to encrypt it. It's the authenticity that is the issue here, right. okay? So this whole thing, including the locked MT5, gets transmitted to the recipient, mm -hmm. okay? So as a recipient, you get the message back pretty easily, okay? From this message, you can compute its own MD5 checksum. The question is, is this MD5 checksum going to match this MD5 checksum? They should. But how do I get back to this MD5 checksum that was computed by the sender? Well, you have to use the sender's public key public. to unlock this box, get this MD5 checksum from the message, Good compare clear. that to this one. If they match, then everything is good. Gotcha. Understand. Is that is is the picture better? Because I, I know in text, you know, it doesn't really spell out the same way. <clears throat> so in other words, if I want to draw the picture here, here's the MD5 in the same file, but the lock this time is unlocked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Unlocked using the senders. Public key. Okay, so you take the unlocked MD5, you compare to the calculated MD5. If they match up, then everything is good. If they don't match up, then you have e you have enough reason to doubt the authenticity of the message. Okay, so it seems like you know everything is done, you know, with encryption and signing and you know the establish uh, establishment of trust. Everything is okay now, but it's not, okay? In other words, let's say I want to go to wellsfargo.com. So I'll just go there right now. Okay. And this is automatically turned into an HTTPS or secure connection. HTTPS is the secure version of, a secure version of HTTP. The question is, am I really connected to Wells Fargo, or am I connected to someone who's pretending to be Wells Fargo? Now, how hard can is it you know, to, for someone to pretend to be Wells Fargo? What, what kind of stuff do they have to do to pretend to be Wells Fargo so that when I type in wellsfargo.com, I go to the hacker's website instead of the actual Wells Fargo website? Or spyware, if put the DNS, or put the record for the DNS. They can be Exactly. If they if they mess up your DNS, you know, look up, then everything is shot. Okay? Because the DNS, you know, how many people have taken a networking class so you know how DNS works? Just on the surface. Okay. So DNS is four one one four one one. Okay, you basically call up four one one and you say, I want to find the IP address of wellsfargo.com. Four one one you know tells you, oh okay, you know, the four, you know, um, the four numbers and then you use the four numbers to actually make the connection. 
but how can you trust that number, the IP address? Are you really sure that the DNS that you connect to can be trusted? Let's say your computer is not hacked. Let's just say that the router for this entire college is hacked. <laughs> so it's not just your computer. It's every single computer on this campus that will all be hacked because you know they will be all be asking for the DNS and say who's wellsfargo.com and guess what the DNS server will all point to the hackers website which pretends to be wellsfargo.com okay so everything that we talked about encryption you can throw it out the door because yep sure enough it is https it's using key pair encryption but it is not actually wellsfargo.com okay so how do we fix this problem how can we know for sure that when we go to wellsfargo.com it really is wellsfargo.com why would you sign certificates okay but, but who's going to sign it it has to be some kind of trust authority Ex exactly okay but those can be spooked. i mean i've saw this thing on this web this guy totally spoofed like yahoo.com mm -hmm. spoofed the certificate and it pointed you to his website but when you read the certificate it said it was yahoo.com like it was like it, it was, and the browser like, does not complain he was at the hacker conference in, in las vegas recently <laughs> and showed how he could spoof the certificate it was kind of scary okay but but, but unless someone does that you know the the key to, to the answer to, to that question is you have to have a remember you know user a and b now how come user a can trust user b and user b can trust user a because they were right next to each other they saw each other ran the gbg you know, key generation command, they you know, copy the file using a USB thumb drive, and they were physically able to verify each other's identity. That's how they can establish their trust relationship. So who's going to sign the certificate for Wells Fargo? Trust authority. Trust authority or certificate authorities, the CAs. And there are only so many of the CAs, you know, I think, you know, is it Thorty? Thort, T-H-A-W-T? That's one of the companies, you know, it's one of the security companies, and they all issue these you know, certificates. So what you want to do is you can go to this you know, little, little lock symbol here. If you double click it, it will show you the certificate. In other words, according to the certificate, this is wellsfargo.com. Okay, you are going where you're supposed to go. It does not have ownership information, and in this case, this is the CA. Very signed trust network is the certificate authority. Okay? Now how they actually do this verification is entirely up to very signed. They probably have standards to follow. Okay? A lot of times, you know, if you're looking for a personal certificate, they only have to send an email back to you and you have to receive that email and then either you know reply back to it or click a link in the message. Then they can ver verify, you know, Dr. Tech at drtech.org is really Dr. Tech at drtech.org. But it kind of makes sense, okay? Because, you know, in that case, if I am not Dr. Tech at drtech.com, I should not have been able to get that message to click on the link. But what if someone working for the ISP, like Shorewest, was able to read my message? Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so I'm pretty sure you know Verisign has to do more than just send a message back to you know webmaster at wellsfargo.com, you know, and then have that person to click on a link to verify the identity. So they must have some different ways to doing to do it, especially when a Wells Fargo bank you know, can afford a lot of money. Verisign can actually send a person over to the bank you know headquarters and do it on site. Well, if you do it on site, you can probably establish the trust relationship. It's going to cost more money, but guess what? Wells Fargo can afford it. There's different kinds of certificates you can get. You can get like a basic one where it says, you mm -hmm. get the green lock up in the corner, and then you get the ones like this one where it says, this mm -hmm. is Wells Fargo, not this, this certificate's valid. Yep. Now, I want you guys you know, to go to my website, you know, go to someprofs.org, but this time use HTTPS to go there. I cannot do it here because you know, I already you know, have the key stored. I can, I can always revoke it first. But if you do it on your computer, which does not have 
my key already you know, accepted, and you go there, do you see a message popping up? And it's giving you a big warning sign and say, I don't know about this because the identity of some prof.org cannot be established. Now, why is it giving you that message? Because you're chief. Because I'm chief, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, but please don't call district and say, you know, there's a security issue. It's only because I'm cheap because I don't want to pay money to have VeriSign to sign my certificate. So mine is actually signed by CA Cert, you know, which is not one of the um, certificate authorities. <coughs> and therefore, the browser who does not know about CA Cert will say, hey, whoever signed this message, I'm not quite sure they can be trusted either. And that's why it gives you a message. <coughs> now, this is your protection. To a certain degree, it is your protection. If you go to bofa.com and you see this message that popped up on your screen, don't go any further. Okay? Now, what is the difference? I mean, you know, but Tech told me that we can just go to someprof.org and just keep going. But how come, you know, with Bank of America, you know, I have to stop right away and call Bank of America and say and report a problem? That's why we know you. We told you it was trusted. Well, just because I told you it can be trusted doesn't mean that, you know, it. Well, we know it's you, right? Well, there's nothing, there's nothing really secure on your site anyway. That would well, your grades are actually on the website. You know that is you know privacy. Okay, so we we do have certain things to protect on the website. Okay, by comparing your grades and also the association between your name and your student ID, comparing that to what you have to do with WellsFargo.com or BofA.com, do you see any differences? If someone else, you know, get your password and log in as you to someprofs.org, what is the worst damage they can do? They can spam other people and send nasty messages and stuff like that, right? Like but when I... They might cause you to fail, but, you, but I would be able to look at, you know, the, the activities and actually see that it did not come from the students and, you know, therefore things can be done to fix that, right? But if someone you know gets your username and your password to log into Bank of America, what can that person do? Well, that person can add himself or herself as one of the payees, and then go to your pay your bill pay in interface, and say, well, let's see, my balance has twenty thousand dollars or whatever amount of money you have, and you know I'll just send everything to that payee. Now the payee probably is going to be an account that, gonna, that cannot be traced, otherwise you know, the crook is really done. Yeah. But the bottom line is there, there is a difference. So when you see that message, when you go to any website that would require you know, a lot more personal information, you definitely have to stop. Someprofs.org does not have that kind of you know, sensitive information on it. And that's why you know, I told you guys, it's okay, I'm just being cheap. You can go ahead and just accept that certificate. You know, so that it doesn't give you that message. But tech, well since nothing on you know, some profs.org is really that important, how come we have, you know, how, how come you know, I still recommend people to go through HTTPS? Because like nobody gets your student number or your password. Exactly, yep. Okay, what are the chances that someone might want to launch a man in the middle of an attack on you know, some profs.org? Pretty low because you know the effort put into it is not even worth it. You know they don't get enough stuff out of the whole thing, so it's not worth the effort. Very good. So we understand you know security. So uh, are we doing okay so far? You know in terms of encryption, signing messages, and also the certificates that you you have to deal with 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 HTTPS or anything that relies on SSL. No questions. It's all good? All right, excellent. So the next time you see, or the next time you receive a message by email, you know, let's say your uncle sent you a message and say, oh, guess what, you know, I, I just made, you know, $30 million. Come meet me you know, at this place, you know, at this time. What are you gonna do? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you will probably have to tell that person and say, you know, send me your certificate and also make sure you sign your messages. 
And then after everything is done, then you just call your uncle, right? <laughs> and they just call your uncle and say, "Did you send that message to me?" <clears throat> But nothing can be trusted. The bottom line is, emails particularly cannot be trusted. Yep. Uh, I used to work for my laws of business in the other domain spoof, and somebody sent out, they estimate somewhere along the line of 5 million email messages that supposedly came from our domain. Uh huh, but that's uh, easy to do. I mean, spoofing so, a domain is. Right, and some of those got to our actual customers um, just by sheer chance. Uh huh. And uh, so we got several complaints about it, but um, they, there was, you know, I got pretty good at detecting them after that, but um, they, For cyber crimes, they want to see a two million dollar real loss before they'll ever even get involved. The authorities, the FBI. Oh, so oh, unless you lose two million dollars or more mm -hmm. in that type of attack, they don't even talk to you. I see. And uh, so they the said it is very easy to do. They said that that person probably hacked our domain or spoofed our domain and, and sent out all of those through a botnet within ten minutes. Yeah. Well, you're talking about phishing, right? P h i s h i n g. You know, basically, you send a message message to someone, and say, you know, well, you know, we receive a security alert, you know, about your account. Somebody just, you know, tried to withdraw, you know, fifty thousand dollars from your account. In order to protect you, click on this link, and so that we can, you know, re-establish your identity and change your password. So that's usually, you know, how it goes. So you're talking about that type of a. Attack. Right. It's a, it's called they don't want to verify credit card information on file. Yep. And we got so many bounce backs from invalid addresses that it crashed our server, uh, shut it down. Um, wow. So they sent a couple million out, and we got in like 300 something thousand within about a 20 minute time frame. Wow. And it, it almost took out our ISP, couldn't handle it, uh, but just the traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, but it shut down our server completely. Just completely locked in. Wow. So do these keys expire at some point? Because I'm SSHing into servers and things like that. I get rejected sometimes and have to go into my host or into my file and delete the RSA key. Yes. Okay. It's up to you to decide. You know, when you do the homework assignment this time, you know, the lesson for GPG, you will see, or, or if you read the notes, you will see that you know it will ask you, you know, how long do you want your key to stay in place. Because you can make your key expire after a certain period of time, okay. So you can do it if you want to. The question is, once your key expires, anything that was encrypted using that key pair, can you still retrieve the content, or does the software just stop letting you encrypt new content using that key? That's the question. Because if you think about it, if your key expires. And the software does not let you to decipher any content that was encrypted using that key pair before. You can potentially lose stuff that you have encrypted before. So you have to kind of think about that a little bit and make sure that you know you don't accidentally lock your own stuff out. <laughs> What about that encryption thing that we did to the partition? Remember your virtual machines? They all they all have partition level encryption. That is not key pair you know, type of encryption. Okay, it has one single key and uses the key to this, uh, to to encrypt the, to encrypt the partition. It uses the same key to decipher your partition. Because in this case, it's not a transmission thing. There's no sender versus recipient. It's all local, and that's why it does not need a key pair type of scheme. Okay, but it's just the same. If you do not log in for two months, you forget your password. To your encrypted partition, there's no way to get the content back. <laughs> okay. So out in out there in the IT world, okay, <coughs> most IT administrators actually have to keep track of many many passwords, and supposedly, you know, those administrators cannot use the same password for everything. That's a big security exposure right there. So the question is, you know, how do you think these administrators can keep track of all of these different <coughs> keys, all of these different passphrases to all the different accounts that they have to deal with? Password managers. Hmm? Password managers. Okay. Now, how do I get a password manager? I can go to Fry's. There's a little booklet that they sell. 
to store the passwords and also what they're intended for. How about that solution? <laughs> it's not safe at all, right? I mean, it's all printed. Anyone can, you know, who, anyone who can steal that little book can read everything, make photocopies, and you know, there's no security. So, what what do you do with your keys if you're a, an IT administrator? You have to encrypt it. Yep. So you need a master password to the file itself, and then inside the file, it will store the password and also what it is used for. If you have a smartphone, you can also do that on a smartphone. Okay. You know, smartphones. You know, like the Android. You know, I have an application. You know, which is kind of like a key ring. You know, to all these little digital keys. So it has a master keyword to unlock the content. But once you unlock the content, you can look inside and find out, you know, okay, for this website, I'm using this, this password. For this website, I'm using this password, and so on. The big question is, how much can you trust that app? <laughs> okay, how do you know that app is not sending secret messages back to Mothership? <laughs> Yep, wrap it with tin foil, yep, or Faraday cage, or something like that. So you have to think about all these things, you know, when you use electronic devices, particularly phones and computers, to store your password because they can all go online to send your entire file of passwords to somebody else. Okay. Has anyone does anyone like anime, you know, movies and stuff like that, Japanese anime stuff? No. You okay? I, I think you know maybe about half the class did not want to raise your hand because you just don't think that it's okay for people to know that. Okay, for those of you who like anime, okay, here's a show that you should uh, watch. Summer Wars. The name is called Summer Wars. <clears throat> um, I look. At, I recommend this movie particularly because it is related to stuff that we just talked about, okay? Um, you watch anime, you know, Japanese anime, and you think, well, yeah, well, these are you know, shows intended for 14, 15 year old kids. Well, maybe, okay, you know, that may be the case. This one is no exception. However, this, as a science fiction, the premise <coughs> here is that since most people need some way to keep track of their passwords, and it turns out that most people store their password online. Okay? You know, with you know social websites, you know, Facebook or whatever, they have online websites to store their passwords. And then a particular organization, you know, that I will not name, you have to watch the movie to find out which organization, was developing an AI to attack other computers. In other words, it's it's breeding, you know, a particular you know, program that can infect other servers so that you can actually go into other servers and grab, you know, the files and, you know, trash the files and whatnot. So that particular AI program was able to lock, you know, to break into these websites to, to, to help people store the passwords. Okay? Are you guys following so far with this storyline? And so the AI, which originally was completely virtual, you know, the, oh, the worst thing it can do is to break into another server and you know, delete files or grab you know, secret files and whatnot. Now it suddenly had the password to also have access to physical control stuff, like traffic control, air traffic control, you know, satellite orbit you know, programming thing, and so on and so forth. In other words, in the end, the AI actually got control you know, to stuff that is in the physical world. Now, you can watch this show and, and, and tell me you know, that it's, well, you know, like it's going to happen. But I tell you, the AI part, I don't really believe. I don't think you know, there's an AI you know, smart enough to do that yet. But you, if you, has anyone been following Anonymous? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anonymous versus you know, several things. You know, first, Scientology. <coughs> Anonymous versus uh, what is the? Um, mm-hmm. Okay, and I think they are also picking up on something new now. Yeah, HB Harry. Yeah, HB Harry was kind of it's kind of in the aftermath mode at this point. Yeah, going after the <coughs> Westboro Baptist Church. The people. Oh, that's right. Yeah, going after the church now. Yeah. Okay, so 
And if those guys can do you know, stuff that they have done so far, it is not inconceivable that they can also break into websites that help people store their passwords. <coughs> okay? So, so if you minus the AI component of this movie and delete all the kiddie stuff, the storyline itself is actually somewhat believable. So I you know, recommend people to watch this one, not for the kiddie stuff, you know, but for the, for the background of you know, the dangers of storing passwords online and also how much of stuff that we actually c control online these days. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, uh, <coughs> I wrote a, a paper about the cloud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like this big negative at the last employer I had. Everybody's like, we're going to put everything in the cloud. Everything's going to the cloud. And I'm like, I hope not everything. Because you're about to see your <coughs> company <coughs> into bankruptcy. Because you can't put everything in the cloud. You're trusting other people with highly sensitive information. And you're just literally making it web accessible, mm -hmm. which is like, well, if you, some of you might have here heard the term attack surface. Mm -hmm. You want to limit your attack surface. You want to make sure that you know, instead of about 100 doors that you can possibly break into, there's only one. So you really just got to keep a really close eye on that one door. But when you yep. put yourself out there in the cloud, your, your attack surface is gigantic. <laughs> and you're, it's just not really a good idea. There's ways to mitigate it, but it's, it's, it's dangerous. It's hard to say, you know, because if you don't go to the cloud, you are actually singling yourself, you know, to be like outside the cloud also. Yep, go ahead. And would it be safe to say that since we've encrypted our drives that we're keeping a virtual server on, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, if you put a, uh, your password list on, <coughs> on an encrypted drive, then at no point nobody else can break into it. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so that's, that's, a good, that's a good argument. The argument was you know, if you have a partition that is entirely encrypted, okay, and let's say you use a strong password and the encryption scheme itself is secure enough, okay? But whenever you want to read that stuff, you still have to go through some kind of software running on top of an operating system, and most likely your computer has internet access at a time, okay? So that means they still have a chance to look at your drive after you enter your passphrase to unlock it. You know, because if the operating, operating system itself is infected, when you unlock the drive, then they get everything. They can see everything on the drive as if it is not encrypted at all. Encrypting the drive is only useful if your drive is stolen by itself when it is offline. Yep. So then the only, the only real way you can protect <coughs> that is to have a uh, laptop that was not internet accessible and encrypt, have a, a drive separate drive encryption with your password. If it's not internet accessible, you don't. Exactly. There's no way that anybody could get that information. Yep. What, whatever key ring you want to use, okay, if it is entirely disconnected from everything else and has no chance of talking to anything else, not even USB, okay, right. and you are the only person who will be reading the password and the username so that you will be transferring that information, then it is relatively safe. If this device by itself can have any chance to talk to the external world, either it is Wi-Fi enabled, it is 3G enabled, or it has a USB plug. Because when you plug that thing into a computer and that computer is infected, guess what? Whatever is in your key ring is gone. Can be. Yep. Did you have a point? No? Okay. So so I think you know things are getting very interesting because you know as I was reading you know how you know, anon anonymous and uh, is it what is the company that they got into HB HB Gary HB Gary it was the same time that they also came up with new uh, UAVs you know the stealthy you know kind of Delta Wing UAVs and if you just combine those two ideas and say oh I want to make a new sci-fi movie that's one right there. Hearing about how the UA, the Predator drones, were sending unencrypted data back to the ground. Yeah, but that's just you know, ju that's just you know, looking through the camera of the of the of the Predator, and I think that helped the insurgents to avoid you know, getting detected because they knew that they are coming. Just looking through the camera of the UAV, they knew, oh, they're coming this way. Okay, better step away from the from the flight path. But if you think about the control sequence, that's even worse, right? I mean, because if someone has remote control, unauthorized control over a UAV, 
that per, those people only need computers. They don't need any money to fight a war because they are borrowing your stuff to fight with you. That, I think, is a big... That's a big thing. You know, I, I think you know, it's, it's... And that's why security is, a, is a, it's such a good field to get employed with because you know, there are all these you know, concepts and all these ideas and they're right there just waiting to happen. I think they're just waiting to happen. Yep. How do you... you <clears throat> what you was telling us in the class last semester about the virus that was spread in the... Stuxnet. Power plant? Yep, that was Stuxnet. Okay. Now, Stuxnet is also interesting because, you know, let me just kind of update the class. I know most of you already know that story. How many people do not know what is Stuxnet? Okay, very good. Okay, Stuxnet is a computer virus. Okay, so you normally think, you know, since, well, since we are also going to talk about CLAM, you know, so virus is actually within the scope of today's, of today's class. So if you think about virus, what do you think a virus would normally do when they infect a personal computer? Okay, first create a backdoor so you can install updates, additional stuff, okay, add-ons to the, all the malware. And once they install all that malware in, with a backdoor, what do they usually do other than that? Hmm? Okay, they turn your computer into a zombie, right? So as a zombie, your computer becomes you know, one of the army of you know, like millions of computers, you know, collectively called a botnet. So that when you know, really bad hackers you know, want to launch a DOS attack, say, on Wells Fargo, they would just contact you know, these botnets through one of the many means and say, OK, you know, at this time, we'll all try to log in to Wells Fargo all at the same time and just overwhelm their server okay, for an hour until they pay up. Okay, so that's the normal kind of thing that you associate with getting infected by a virus. Okay, <coughs> or it can get into your directory, get into your email program, grab an email list so they they can spam all your friends. Okay, the virus can spam all your friends and stuff like that. Or they can get your file. Okay, they can get your TurboTax file. So now they know your name, your social security number, and everything else they need to, in order to impersonate you. That's the kind of normal thing that you associate with getting infected by a virus, but not the Stuxnet virus. The Stuxnet virus was discovered by the Iranians inside the control computers of a nuclear plant. And its only job was to shut down a nuclear plant control system. Okay? Now, you would think that that's pretty easy, right? Just kill the PC. Okay, it's because you know we have a PC right here. Okay, and let's say this PC is running a software that displays you know, all the various parts of a nuclear plant, and with all the control things, you know, showing the, the coolant, the direction, and whatnot. You would think if I shut down this computer, turn it off, unplug it, blow it up, the nuclear plant will shut down. That's not true. Okay. Because, nu because nuclear plants, just like any plants, okay, the control system is entirely distributed. The actual control units are called bricks. Okay? They, are, you know, they, they have different sizes, but the typical one is about the size of this thing here. And it's distributed on the floor, everywhere. They control the turbine, they control the assembly plants, they control the robots you know, that, that will put cars together. Okay? And the PC is nothing more than a terminal. Okay? It's only for monitoring the plant. It's not for, and also if you want to, you can control the plants too. But if you kill the PC, like blow it up, everything else will keep going. So the Stuxnet virus is not just going to shut down or infect the PC itself. It actually contains software to update these individual small controllers throughout the entire plant. It would actually upload new instructions to these things and say, oh, go ahead and retract all the boron rods or stop the flow of coolant or something along that line to shut down the nuclear plant. Okay? So we are talking about you know, a virus or a mal malicious software that is custom engineered to shut down a nuclear plant. Okay, well, that's not difficult to do, is it? I mean, if you know the control software, you can probably write a virus like that. But the same virus also came with, if I remember correctly, is it three zero-day exploits or more? 
Does anyone know what is a zero day exploit? It's something nobody knows, it, knows about it yet. Exactly, something that nobody knows anything about yet. So Microsoft does not know about it, Adobe does not know about it, no one knows <coughs> anything about it. Having one is quite good, okay? A hacker has to be pretty good to find one. Having two is really rare because most hackers, if they find one, they will use it right away, okay? This thing had three, okay? So somebody did enough research, did enough hacking, and not to use any one of the discovered exploits until this thing is ready to roll out. And they have three zero-day exploits in the same malicious software. This hardware was also not even connected to the internet. Hmm? It was also not even connected to the internet. It was also not connected to the internet, and the authorities in Iran thought that uh, it was, it was uh, infected by USB drives. They said they turned that off, though, if I remember. They turned it off? Yeah. Well, somehow it got into the control system. Yeah, somehow it did. Yeah, that would have been my question. How, I mean, <coughs> why, on a security system that, that tech, you would think that all, any access where you could put data on, a, on their system would have been disconnected. I mean, no USB, no, no way to plug that information into the <coughs> Well, the question is how is USB blocked, okay? There are, there's software block and there's hardware block. Hardware block means you just use the epoxy and plug up the plug USB up. plug, right? I mean... If you turn it off in the BIOS, <coughs> you just turn off the hardware and you the BIOS. If you turn it off in the BIOS, any, anyone who has actual physical access to that box would yeah. be able to do it. Well, there's another way to do it, too. Well, you can password protect the BIOS. I mean, well, that's, they're fairly hard to crack. Well, there, but there are other things that they can do too, you know, because if the, if the network inside the nuclear plant is quote unquote trusted, all you need is to plug in something else to the switch. And that something else will quote unquote automatically become, you know, trusted, and then you can talk to all the other computers, and you, you know, the other computers can be infected this way too. So, so they're being carried in on a hand, uh, a hand computer, for instance. Yes. And plug in at any terminal throughout you the can, whole plant. You can make a um, TCP IP server of sorts, okay, you know, depending on the protocol. But if you choose a simple enough protocol, you can actually make a server not much bigger than the USB thumb drive. I think it came out of the phone, personally. Well, but the phone does not have a real you know, physical wired connection. It can, though. It's not right. Yep. Um, the smallest I've seen is kind of like a fob. You know, that's the smallest device you can make that can hook up to a wired interface, you know, and talk to the rest of the network. So that really tells you something about, you know, you know the, the future of, you know, computer security. So you guys are all in the right class, I think. I mean, because it'll... Like this, Dad. Hmm? It's Bluetooth. It's Bluetooth, you know, the a Bluetooth is really small because USB is small. If you look at the um, uh, RJ, is it 45? Yes. Yeah, RJ45 is a significantly bigger plug, and that's why that device is going to be a little bit bigger. But nonetheless, it's not really hard to plug it in. You know, the worst thing you can do is actually to plug that thing in to an actual computer and have a pass-through port to plug back into the actual network then it becomes almost undetectable because it is just in line with all the other equipment. So, so how common are viruses that attack control systems? Hmm? I would assume they're not running on a 386 architecture for the control system for something like nuclear equipment. So how common are viruses for those kind of control systems? I mean, is it, would it be expected that you wouldn't have too many zero-day exploits for equipment like that? Are they that common? But as a zero-day ex zero exploit, you, you cannot even defend against it because you don't know the signature. Well, I know, but I'm saying is it, is it so unusual to have a couple or two or more zero-day exploits against something that doesn't have a lot of viruses written for it to begin with? Because I wouldn't expect that your average Eastern European internet thug is going to be writing control system viruses. Yeah, they have some suspicions of who's behind it. Yeah. Uh, but that will turn this class into a political class, too, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I don't want to turn it into a party side. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, yes, there probably are things that are going to be exposed to
go through, oh, I need something to regulate the power. Well, I don't want to go outside to get that because that could potentially bring in something bad to my system. So I'm going to build it myself. Well, if someone manages to get their hands on your construction, go through it, because you don't have the huge resources that it's amassed, uh, I would like a better word, has for finding those things and identifying them and then fixing them, you're more likely to have more exploits that exist within your system that something can be <coughs> Well, all I can say is computer security is go only going to be more and more important. You know, it cannot go back in the other direction. You know. So you can't kill the power. Well, the power grid itself is now called a smart grid system. <laughs> so think about that. But it has to be generated somewhere. It has to be generated somewhere. Sort of. We went to a couple of years ago. Actually, went to a meeting about the smart grid. They have a actual military protected central area for the power grid. I think it's in Folsom. Around. <laughs> they have a couple of different spots. Depends on who's like EDU has their own spot. Anything that is smart, anything that can talk, that can communicate is susceptible. Period. <laughs> Your washing machine is going to turn against you. They actually <laughs> just built a whole new sub internet strictly for home house appliances. There's always a way to get through. You know, you just have to bounce a few times to get there. So, you know, I, I think, you know, this entire field is going to get very interesting in the next decade or so. You know, I think we'll start to see very interesting intersections between the things that we see today that are somewhat disjoint. Like, you know, the Stuxnet thing is one thing. Um, Anonymous, which is a group of hackers, you know, that has their own critical objective is one kind of independent thing. And then the UAVs, you know, definitely looks like, you know, their own indi individual thing. But if you put all of these things together, you get a pretty scary picture. <laughs> you know, I really think that's a pretty scary picture. <coughs> so getting back to, you know, our stuff, okay? You know, the, the second topic is CLAM FS or CLAM file system, which is actually a very simple thing, okay? Um, <coughs> So the theory is you can install your CLAM file system so that, because in Linux we don't really have, you know, Norton utility. Well, there is, but, you know, but nothing is free like that, okay? And CLAM is free. So CLAM FS is kind of interesting. So let me just kind of keep going to show you what you can do. Okay. So to do this, you have to install several packages. You know, you have to install CLAM FS, Fuse Utility System, and File. File is really not needed. You know, I just want to use that command to show you, you know, that ClamFS works. <clears throat> okay, so you have to set up group ownership. You know, in other words, you know, whoever wants to run ClamFS as an end user also has to be a group of the Fuse user group. Okay, so this, the instructions are all kind of here. And you have to set up mount points. How many people are new to the concept of mount points? in Linux. Okay, so let me just explain this a little bit here. And to explain that, the best way to do it is to show you, you know, a command prompt. In Windows, how do you identify a drive? Conventionally, I know Windows NT can actually do something di different. But conventional using like, you know, good old DOS, how do you identify a drive? A drive letter, right? Every time you add a drive, it's a drive letter. Every time you plug in a USB mass store device, it's a drive letter. Linux does not do that, okay? Linux has one single file system. In other words, you have one single root with no drive letter, and every file, every subfolder, you know, starts from there. So now the question is, well, that's all nice if I have one single big drive, you know, it's, it makes sense, but what if I have multiple drives? Okay, if I have a USB drive, you know, what do I do? And this is, um, it may be a good idea to turn on the lights again. Does anyone have a USB drive? Oh, I actually have one. I stole one from Larry today, so. We're talking about security. <laughs> okay, so here's a regular USB thumb drive, okay? It's, it, it's formatted to NTFS, so it's not a Unix type of USB thumb drive. So I want to show you something first, okay? You can type this command inside the virtual machine. It's not going to do you a whole lot of good, but you can do it anyway, okay? <coughs> when you type mount and then just press the enter key, 
it shows you, quote unquote, all the amount of points. Okay? So let me show you what I mean by amount of point. Um, the most obvious one is kind of here. Okay. So this part here, the highlighted portion, is the actual device. Slash dev, slash SDD, maps to a particular you know, actual hardware device. In this case, it maps to the CD-ROM drive on the computer. And when you see the word on, that means you know this physical device is mounted onto this, what we call a mount point. The mount point, in this case, is basically saying, you know, we start with slash, that's our root folder. Live is a subfolder inside the root folder, and image is a subfolder inside live. So whatever content is on the quote unquote, you know, drive inside the SDD you know, device will appear in slash, slash live slash image. So that this means you, know, you can add a mount point to any place you want in Linux. Okay? So what, what does that mean? Anytime you have a folder, a, a directory, you can mount a hardware device or something else to that particular directory. So that directory is no longer a subcomponent of the contain of the parent. It is it can be quote unquote mapped to an entirely different device or an entirely different area in the file system. Okay, are we doing okay so far? Concept wise. Okay. So let's take a look at media. Okay. So media is one of the folders where you know most of the devices will mount to. Okay. Not all, but most devices amount to media. And since I ran this command, ls slash media, and it did not show anything, that means nothing is mounted over there at this point. The folder is, is completely empty. So the next thing I will do is I'm going to plug in you know, Larry's you know, thumb drive. And <coughs> yeah, let's find an empty slot to do it right there. And this computer is set up to automatically mount you know, any USB mass store device. So let's ignore the user interface. Okay, the GUI part we'll ignore. Okay, let's, let's just you know, go back here. And I take a look at media again. And here I have a new folder. Okay, flash eight is a new folder that was created when I plug in a drive. Okay, so that means you know this is a new mount point. Okay, the mount point is slash media slash flash underscore eight. Okay, it's a new folder that is created on the fly. When I type the command mount, you will see that I have a new device now, SDG one. <coughs> Which is a physical device, you know, it's actually a partition of the physical device, and the mount point is slash media flash eight. And that's how in Unix, you know, how, how in Linux you can mount a different device to any mount point. Okay, you can create a subfolder and then you remap the subfolder to some file system. Are we doing okay in terms of the concept? Yep. Now this uh, does Linux automatically Use the USB for media. Um, that part is up to you. You can you can turn it off if you want to. So if I go to media flash eight, you can see that these are the content on the drive itself. Okay, so this is a much more flexible scheme compared to the drive letter scheme, because we have one single root folder and everything starts from the root folder. The convention is to mount everything under slash media. But that's really just a convention and nothing more than that. If you choose and say, I want to mount something in my home folder, if root can do it, it can be done. Okay, if you have root access, you can mount a, 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 a drive to any mount point. What about as an, as an end user? Well, as an end user, that's fuse. That's why there's F-U-S-E, you know, which is an end user level type of file system. So now, as an end user, you can also have your own mount points. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about you know Clamp FS and how it works. It's usually better with a picture, but the concepts are all in the notes already. But I want to illustrate the concept using this picture. 
clam AD, okay, clam AD antivirus is the core of the, the, the open source antivirus package. But by itself, it's not really a very attractive package. Because what it does is it gives you a command, okay? The command is called clam scan. Clam scan is going to, if you just type clam scan and enter, it will just do a virus scan on the current directory recursively. So everything in your folder and everything inside the subfolders will all be checked. Okay? How many of you want to rerun clam scan every single time you do something that can change a file? Probably be not a good idea. Okay? So this, this is the utility program. That is good if you want to check on a particular file, a particular folder, or something like that. Okay, you receive an email, you save the attachment, and you can run clam scan on the attachment file itself before you open it up. Okay, that's one limited use of clam scan. But by itself, it's not that useful, okay, because you have to initiate the scan in order for clam scan to work. So what you do is you install clam FS. Okay. Clam FS looks like this, okay? So let's say this is my home folder. And under my home folder, I have one file or one folder called, mm, okay, suspicious, suspicious, okay? And let's say I have another folder called incoming. So these are folders, not individual files. What I can do is I can say, okay, I'll use clamfs. What clamfs can do is to map all the files in incoming, okay, into suspicious. In other words, if I save a file into incoming, it will appear in suspicious. If I create a folder in incoming, it will appear in suspicious. Suspicious is not actually duplicating a file, it is just a portal to look at the same file and the same folders. Is that concept okay so far? It's basically like a, a, a portal, you know, it's a, it's a remote way. So suspicious is a window to look into incoming. But there's one thing that is interesting. Because if you try to get anything out of suspicious, if you try to execute a file, if you try to read a file, if you try to access a file from suspicious, every access will have to go through clam scan first. Okay? If you get something out of incoming by itself, everything goes, okay? If, you, if your file is infected, it doesn't care. You can still open the file. If you open the same file through suspicious, the opening act itself will make the file go through clam scan. If clam scan says, oh, this file is infected, it won't even let you open the file. In other words, if you put any file into incoming or suspicious, but you only access the file like reading it or try to execute it through suspicious, you're automatically protected against known viruses that ClamScan can deal with. Yep. So you said it doesn't make, actually make a copy, so it's like a it's link. It's not a copy, it it's is like a link. A link then. It, is, it is kind of like a link. A protected link. Let's say. Exactly, yep. Whenever you access the file, it will be scanned. So this is an on-demand type of scanning. Only when you access the file, it will be scanned. And if I remember correctly, ClamFS also has a cache, which means it remembers you know, a file that it has been scanned recently, so it won't have to rescan everything you know, all over again. Yep? Would that work for like multiple user accounts like email? Yes. Where you have all your incoming in that one file, and then massive yep. each their own file, or suspicious somewhat, and then every time they open it, you know it's scanned for Yes, ClamFS works, you know, um, works in both levels. You can set up a system-wide ClamFS configuration file so that root can say for the entire system, for everybody, okay, let's say, you know, slash var, slash pool, slash email will be mapped so that, you know, everything that you get out of that folder, regardless of how many subfolders level you have, will be scanned automatically. So that will apply to the entire file system, to the entire system. So that, you know, if you're, if anyone uses any email client program on that system, they're automatically protected. But you can also make it so that it works on a per user basis. Okay? Because you know, it's going through Fuse, and one of the things that Fuse can do 
is it allows each individual user to do something like this. So you can basically mount, remount an existing directory into a different mount point, but when you remap it to a different mount point, it will go through clamp FS or it will go through clamp automatically. Wouldn't it be better for the administrators to go ahead and take, the, take more control over the system though and not actually give each user that, that option where then it has to be scanned and if it is bad, they just scan over the period? That's fine. You can have both too. They do not conflict with each other. That's the nice part too. Is the system can have a system-wide you know, uh, plan and say all incoming e email will go through you know, slash bar, slash spoof, slash email, and that is already mapped through you know, ClamFS. But the end user can set up additional folders inside the home folder that will also be scanned if that end user you know, chooses to do it that way. So ClamFS you know, is basically on-demand scanning using you know, the imitation of a file system. Is it possible to actually cut off the link to the directly to the files where you can only get through it through the, through the suspicious folder? That's a good question. I don't think when you do this clamp FS mounting you can change the permissions. So that's a that's a good question. I have not looked into that. This, you know, the question was, you know, is it possible so that you know, when you do a mapping like this, the end user will no longer be able to access anything through incoming, and all the files can only be accessed through suspicious, and I have not done the research to see whether that's possible. I know by default you can still access it from either directory. So you have to do some permission you know, changing in order to lock down you know, incoming so that everything can only come out of suspicious so they will, all, all, they will all be automatically scanned. So that's the whole concept of ClamFS is, you know, it is quote unquote automatic and it is also scanned on demand. If you have 20 terabytes of stuff inside a folder, it doesn't spend all the time scanning 20 terabytes of files because if you only access, you know, a 10 kilobyte file, it will only scan the 10 kilobyte file. Yep. Is there a lot of uh, viruses out for running ClamFS? I do not know. Does anyone know how many viruses are out there for Linux, targeting Linux systems? 15 or 20? That's it? Okay, not 15,000? <laughs> because if you look at the signature base of Windows, you know, I think it's up to 60, 70,000 so at least. Because, uh, Windows is <coughs> more popular. Hmm? It's because Windows is more popular, so they uh, designed their viruses for Windows systems. Well, Windows is harder to defend against, you know, because what happens when you install Windows 7 Home on a computer? You slow down and use up all your... <laughs> 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 well, that's one thing. Besides that. Yes, besides that. Who's, who's the default user? You've got service packages to install everything. SP1 is out, yes, yes. Yeah, but who but who is the default user? The no, default user is also the administrator with no password. You turn on the computer, it will go through all the durations, it automatically logs in to the default user if you have a home installation. If I remember correctly, seven professional would work exactly the same way unless you tweak it. Okay, so you actually have to do something to protect the accounts. You have to say, oh, don't make me an administrator. Make me a regular user in order to make yourself a regular user. In Linux, it's the opposite. Okay, in Linux, it's quite the opposite. If you just say add user, blah 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 blah, without having, without going through, you know, vi sudo, okay, to change the sudo file, a regular user is just that, a regular user. Okay, if a regular user runs Firefox or you know runs some sort of dumb software and get infected then only the files that that user normally has access to can be infected, most of the time. Okay? If you have a file that is susceptible to attacks, and then it's a different story. In Windows, it's the, it's, the, it's the other way around. Everybody is an administrator, so everyone can make registry changes, everyone can install new DLLs, and everyone can change executables to all the system programs. So that means, by default, we're looking at an inversion of how things look like. Okay, from one perspective in Windows, by default, you have full access to do anything. In Linux, 
By default, you're just a regular user and you have very limited permission to do anything to the system itself. You can nuke your own folder all day long. That's fine, okay? But you're not going to touch the system files. Okay, so that's the first difference. What is the second difference between Windows and Linux? Can you tell that um, that is an admin account for what permissions purposes to install stuff? Okay. Now, from the programming perspective, you know, I know this is not a programming class, so I'll just kind of briefly mention that. From the programming perspective, to talk to the Linux operating system, the interface is like this much, okay? In other words, if you want to ask the Linux operating system to do anything, create a folder, read this file, write to that file, I want to make a connection to the internet, yada, 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 the interface looks like this. Okay? Everything has to funnel through a single interface to talk to the operating system. So that means defending is a little bit easier because you're, you're, you're per, you, you only have a hole about this big okay? between the applications and the operating system. In Windows, how many calls do you have? How many APIs do you have? Application programming interface do you have? So that an application can ask the operating system and say, I want to do da 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 da. It's huge. And it gets bigger. Every time you, you install a new DLL, it gets bigger. So it's almost impossible. It, make, it makes it very difficult to defend against you know, exploits. Because somebody is going to make some mistake, and one of these DLLs you know, is not fully secure. But it's really hard to check, because everyone can install additional stuff to your operating system. That, that's also why you know, Windows is less secure. It's not because the kernel itself is not secure, it's because it is so easy to add additional stuff to the operating system itself. But that's from the programming perspective and not you know, from the um, you know, operating perspective. You know, when you use Windows, you know, it's Windows is it's Windows. Yep. Well, with Windows, uh, <coughs> sometimes you go to a different website and it'll automatically uh, access your Internet Explorer and add toolbars without even asking you at times. I think it's supposed to ask you at some point, but Internet Explorer is the other reason why Windows is not secure. In Linux, you cannot run Internet Explorer. Some people have tried very hard to run Internet Explorer in Linux for the purpose of watching Netflix. Okay, because Netflix only has a back, has a, has a back end for Windows. It doesn't have a back end for Linux. So if you want to connect to Netflix and watch movies, you have to go through all kinds of gyrations because you know, you just, it's just not easily done. Okay? So if you compare Internet Explorer, which is the default browser of Windows, versus you know, let's say Firefox, doesn't matter which one you pick, just pick anything other than Internet Explorer. What is the big difference? Hmm? Okay, that's one difference. But technically speaking, what is the difference, big difference between Firefox or Chrome. Open source. Hmm? Open source. Well, open source, okay. You know, but the, compare that to um, security. But why is the, why does it make a difference? The integration of the operating system. Okay, now you're getting close. Very close. What is the name of that feature? Active. ActiveX. Okay, ActiveX means that Internet Explorer can run native 386 <coughs> code from inside the browser as add-ons. What about Firefox add-ons? I mean, you can browse all day long and say, oh, I want to install this add-on, I want to install that add-on. What are the add-ons written in, in terms of programming language and the environment? JavaScript, okay? And JavaScript is already you know, a few levels away from the actual operating system itself. So if they want to protect it, it's a little bit easier to protect JavaScript um, executables from doing malicious stuff than native code. Okay, Internet Explorer allows native code to execute, and that's you know also you know one security hole because you know you can install add-ons that has just about any access right that you want to you know that is possible. Yep. Uh, I was just gonna say, I mean, doesn't JavaScript have like a, a, like kind of like a set of tenants that it has to? It's a sandbox already. Yeah, it's, it's already yeah, it's like a sandbox. Like if it, yep. it says it cannot interact directly with you know certain stuff or I, can't, but I, I read it. It's like a five tenants that it must not do or it's not considered like correct distributable. 
but there are still exploits or there are still security flaws occasionally, you know, but it's not a, it's not usually a big gaping hole. It is there, but it's not a big gaping yeah. hole. Yep. So with uh, Firefox, for instance, it doesn't actually, you said that uh, your, your operating system is protected, basically. So no program that we install in the Linux machine will actually, without being asking for the root permissions, actually it's get, not, to, the, get okay. to the... The operating system. If everything works the way it's supposed to, then that is true, okay? But there are programs that will elevate your privileges when the program executes. So if that program has a security flaw and someone knows how to exploit that security flaw, it is possible for someone to log in as a normal user, run a particular command that has to gain improve, uh, in, um, a higher privilege level and feed it some you know, content that will break the program and then you will eventually gain you know, um, a higher privilege level. So it is still possible. It is still possible to do it, and that's why you still see patches for Linux. You know, Linux will get, you know, when I run, you know, I run Debian, and every few days you know, I have you know, a patch to the kernel. So they still have you know, security holes to patch. It's just not as wide, and the hole is not, a, it's not as gaping big. But you know, Linux by itself is not entirely secure because you know those programs that you run, you know, can still have security flaws. I can give you one example. You know, programs that you have run, you know, quite a few times already. Netstat, N-E-T-S-T-A-T. -T. Okay. Now, how does Netstat or PS or programs or, or commands like that can list all the processes or find out you know which socket or which, which excuse me, which port of which interface is being listened by which program? Well, it, ha it has to talk to the operating system, right? So at some level, it has to talk to the operating system. So if the program has a security flaw, you know, it is possible, possible but not likely, to go through Netstat, feed in certain parameters that are invalid, but somehow the program did not check carefully, and you somehow gain you know, root level access through a program like Netstat, okay? Now this is going back, you know, I know it's not, this is not the day to talk about it, but I'm hoping that you guys do remember something like this, set UID. Remember this thing when we talked about file permissions? And the, in that context, when I say, you know, set G, uh, UID for user ID and GID for group ID, these two flags, you know, when we talked about it, it's only for folder purposes, okay? I want every file created in this folder to start with the ownership the group ownership of the folder itself. Okay, that's how we use you know set GID in the context of you know file permissions. The actual meaning of set UID and set GID is when you execute a program. Okay, it will assume the user ID of whatever you give it. That's the nature. That's the original purpose of set UID and set GID. So that means if a file has a root owner and the set UID flag is turned on, that means in the operating system allows the set UID to take into effect. That means <coughs> whoever runs that command will be running the command as root. If you run a command as root, that means when that command is being run, it will have root privileges to do everything that root can do. Now, with a program like Netstat, the worst thing you can do is to spell out all the programs with all the you know interfaces you know that you can see. But what about Bash? If you run Bash as root, what happens? You have a root shell. When you have a root shell, there's no limit as to what you can do or what commands you can run as root. So that's why there's still a security risk if people don't use this meal properly. They can still open up you know, security holes in the system. It's just that most of these things are so well known that they have programs to check for security risks like these. Yep. Did you hear about the virus that was created for uh, an Apple machine but was accidentally affected uh, Linux machines? Because they are related. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Macintoshes, does anyone know what is the name of the operating system behind all, uh, all modern Macs? BSD. 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 And BSD stands for? Berkeley. Berkeley. 
something distributional. Berkeley standard distribution, okay, which is a branch of Unix. Okay. Now, how does Unix relate to Linux other than the name itself? Linux is just a rewritten Unix kernel. Yep. Linux is a complete rewrite of the Unix kernel. Not entirely the same, but they, it does borrow a lot of concepts. So that means if Unix has a security, pro security problem that is really convoluted, and Linux borrow you know, the same design, it is likely, though not always you know, guaranteed, that the Linux system will also have you know, a similar secu security flaw. But if you compare Mac OS and Linux, there's also a difference, because the target audience is different. Why do you think Microsoft will make the default user an, an administrator? I mean, it's easy enough for the programmers to say, oh, that's not a good idea. We'll have an administrator account. When people set it up, we'll make sure the administrator will set up a 20-character password that has you know, no word that can be looked up from the dictionary, has you know, numbers, uppercase, lowercase, symbols, and whatnot. And you cannot even have you know, three letters in a string. Okay? You have three letters, and then you must have a number or a punctuation of something. And the whole thing has to be 20 characters long. It can, it can crank up the security level all they want. What's going to happen to Microsoft when this, is, you know, when this is done? Just about everything you install in the Windows system has to have. Uh, uh, but that makes it secure. You know, that's why you know, when you work with a virtual machine, every time you want to install a package, you have to run it in root you know, when you log in as root. Which is, you know, this is, this is everyday business to Unix, there, Linux people. Updates would couldn't install in without had the same problem. That's a different you story. They, you it can just, it just want to be user friendly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that is exactly what the point Everybody is. Everybody wants it to be simple, but if you have security, everything's going to start getting complicated. Ex person doesn't even want to use it. <laughs> exactly. Well, or if they want to use it, they will have to call up Microsoft, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm running this program, and suddenly this you know screen pops up and say that I have to log out as a regular user, log in as administrator in order to install the update. And guess what? When they log out as a regular user and try to log in as an administrator password, they cannot remember the 20 character password. People can't remember four digit okay? passwords. <laughs> <laughs> and what are they gonna do? They will call Microsoft, okay? They're gonna call Microsoft and say, I have forgotten my administrator password, or they, they may not even know the administrator account is different from their regular account, okay? So from Microsoft's pers perspective, this will generate just tons and tons of user support, you know, questions, phone calls, email, instant messages, and whatnot. And that's why they did not crank up the security level. The anti-kernel is just as secure as Linux itself. Okay, you know, I have nothing against the anti-kernel kernel itself. Even NTFS, you know, as a file system, can have security crank all the way up, and it is, it, I think it can be more secure than extension three. It's just that by default, it's not turned on. It's not cranked up. I like how they added the UAC, which like defeats the own, it like defeats the purpose, the user account, you know, Windows started prompting you for everything. Are you sure you wanted to do that? Did you want to open yep. this file? And like, even myself, the first thing I said within two minutes doing that is, where do I turn that off? Because that is driving <laughs> me insane. Which turn, like, which, which okay, completely defeats, defeats the of, purpose. Exactly. But, but from, from my perspective, it was, I could not use the computer with that feature on. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I'd be telling it all the time, like, yes, of course I want to open this file. What's the like, difference between I didn't that? click on it for a reason. Well, it does make it does make a good uh, shot if you're running a server on the back, like. But then sometimes I've had applications cause problems on the server side where UAC is getting in the way. I can't just let this server do its business because the UAC keeps. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but that has program, to do with yeah. most things in Windows are done through the GUI, and a lot of things in Linux, most of the time can be done through the command line interface. If you can do things through the command line interface, then you, what you do, you know, as an administrator, this is already not a very good practice already, but some people do this, you know, including myself, if I know my PC is fairly secure physically. Okay? So what I do is, the first thing I do is to change user. I have one terminal to log in as root all the time. 
whenever I need to update the system, I just say aptitude update, aptitude upgrade, and it just you know, brings everything up to date. I don't need every single individual program to tell me, hey, I need to be updated. Oh, I have a new patch here. Do you want to add a new feature? And so on and so forth. I have one single interface to do it. Okay, so let me, let me show you how. Okay, I think sudo dash s you know, would do the same thing. You know, it enters a shell mode for you know, sudo. So the, the way you update the system is to say aptitude update, okay, which will basically download the up-to-date catalog of all the programs, all the packages they can install in Linux, okay? And then you follow that up using, you know, upgrade, which basically means if I have this program already installed and the one that I have installed is an older version, bring it up-to-date, okay? And you can run these two commands using one single line, you know, it's still two commands, but you can just use a semicolon. And that's it. You know, I don't need to deal with the the screen that pops up every single time, everything, you know, something needs to be updated. You know, just two lines brings everything up to date. The kernel, all the programs that I install, you know, all the programming languages that I have installed, everything that I have installed. I think it must be the GUI that does it, because <coughs> I'll, I'll have to type in my password 100 times a day on a Linux system with the command line. But if Windows keeps annoying me about that, I just get irritated and turn it off. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It wasn't intelligent the way they went about doing it. They just kind of started prompting you for everything, regardless of whether it was even something within the operating system required of the effects. That's, it just over-prompted you, which makes people desensitize to the actual threat. Exactly. And they never gave you an option of remembering that you should. Yeah. I would have liked that. So how many people are IT administrators already or you know, somehow has to do with a lot of you know, systems? So how do you guys keep track of your passwords? TrueCrypt. Well, we, we use a password manager, but the, a lot of the more advanced ones mm -hmm. allow for even more administrative control where you can use Active Directory to say, okay, if you're part of this group, then you can see these passwords. That way, you know, even out as the administrators know, you're the junior guys, you don't have access to <laughs> our DNS server's root, <laughs> you know, account or something. You know, so you can distribute it that way, and then uh, that's all encrypted. But like you said, it always comes down to you have a master password that you, mm -hmm. you need to remember, you know, and, uh, you know, they get, they get into groups, you know, these are passwords for all the web servers, these are passwords for all the whatever, and then, uh, the program actually that, that uh, I'm familiar with actually even has your own like little tab within it for just your own. Mm -hmm. So you can add your own entries. But it's still running on the PC that has internet access and it's yeah, it's within the internet. I don't we don't try to put it like online. I mean you'd have to Yeah, but you can but anything on the intranet can still <laughs> dial it home. Yeah. Well as long <laughs> as it's not yeah. I mean the idea is that you're only gonna access it when you're on the internal network. You're not, okay. Yeah. There's no, you can't go to some web log on and just get to it. You're gonna have to be on the VPN and get onto another machine. I see. To get to it, and it has a certificate and all that. You know, so. Okay. But it, but they're web based. That's the other thing I was gonna say too. I mean, a lot of the, these tools are all, uh, they are all web based. Yeah. Like, well, you know, you know if, if it's web based, it's just kind of give me that uneasy feeling. And, and it, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah, so you guys, you guys got to watch that movie. You know, the the ending of that movie is quite dramatic. You know, but from an administration standpoint, like if you have to actually install the software on each of the engineers' computers, so they have mm -hmm. their own thing. It's just something else to manage. It's nice to just be able to say, go here, mm -hmm. <laughs> log in with the accounts that's provided to you. And yeah, I understand that. You know, you the know. the GUI interface of Linux, you know, like GNOME has its own key ring. So you, have, you just have to give it a master password and you can even make it so that it can elevate to root permissions if you want to. So you can automatically authenticate to root permission if you add the root password as a part of the key ring. But it's up to you, you can say, oh, oh you know, I don't want the, the root password to be a part of the key ring. Then every time it needs your root you know, privileges through the GUI, then it will ask you, you know, to enter the, the root password. Have you heard of the single sign-on services? A lot of companies are doing stuff like that where 
I have problems with the concept of a single log. I have problems with the concept of it too, <laughs> but from a user, <clears throat> from a user friend, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. how many how many people have been sick of hearing the call and I lock myself out or something like that? Mm -hmm. I can't get in, the system's not working, and you're like, no, you know you're just fat fingering it, man. You well, <laughs> that brings us to another thing. You know, how many people have read the SSH module, which is the already done? Okay. So in SSH, there are two ways to authenticate, at least two ways. One is typing in the password, okay? That's interactive, and you have to be sitting there you know, typing on the, on the keyboard. The second way is to use a public key, okay? Yeah, so, so if you, as long as you have the public key to match the private key to the account that you want to log into, then everything is good. You don't have to type anything. So this is kind of related to that because, you know, basically, if you have a public key, you can automatically authenticate to the, the um, to the account itself. Yeah. Did you guys go through that exercise? Or did you try yeah. to do that? Okay. I think I was. I did talk about that in the video clip too, because I remember I was doing that to the uh, power server. I illustrated how to do it mm -hmm. from inside a virtual machine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you did. Yeah, you just kind of said. I think you just imported into a direct. Just a different directory to kind of. Authorized keys is yeah. where you need to put that key into. Yeah. Yep. yep. So that's the other way, you know, that's the other thing is, you know, it's not a password. It is a single file that you have to have in order to authenticate to a lo a, a, an account to log in. Yeah, because I mean, it's just at least. You can still have the file stolen though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least where I'm working, I mean, it's not just the IT administrators that have tons of passwords they have to remember. I mean, it's getting to the point where the kid users have. Now, how many people have a habit? of checking a PC for key loggers before you actually sit down and do any work? No. <laughs> 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 uh, maybe check the wire. <laughs> <laughs> because the key loggers, does anyone know what is a key logger? Does everybody understand what a key logger is? Yeah. No? It's, it's a little device, okay, that looks just like a little dongle, okay? Remember those good old days when we have PS2 keyboards and most, you know, keyboards are you know, USB 2 and you have a little converter? A key logger is just the same size. So from the outside, you cannot tell that it's a key logger. So you, pu you plug a key logger into the back of a computer, and then you plug the keyboard into the key logger. So the key logger will now be able to log every single keystroke <laughs> from the keyboard up to you know, some you know, number of you know, keystrokes. Yeah. But as you know, flash memory becomes less and less expensive, I think these days you can easily you know, keep track of you know, a few million keystrokes without having to <coughs> unplug the device. The more dangerous ones are the software. Hmm? So I think that's the more dangerous one is the software. Ones. Yes, the software key logger is more dangerous, you know, but if you're a system administrator, that really opens up, you know, possibilities because, you know, you, you can have someone in the organization and say, hey, I cannot log into my computer, I got myself locked out, okay? And you, oh, you get over there and you say, oh, I can, I can fix this, you know, and then you log in as the administrator, right? If a key logger is installed on that computer, which is not even your computer, yeah. then your password and your username is automatically logged by that computer, okay? The network ones are dangerous because you can have it remotely installed, but in a way they're less dangerous because you can look at the traffic and you say, uh-uh, something is not right here. This program, you know, keeps calling, you know, that particular IP address and, you know, because it, it has to send the, the this key sequence back to, you know, a source. The physical key loggers, you know, are completely silent from the networking perspective. It's just a little device. And it can be a disgruntled employee, you know, who wants to get this administrator password to get back to, to the company. How they that's why I asked, you know, do you, do you guys, you know, actually check in on, on the back of the computer and make sure there's yeah, nothing? Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you could, yeah, that's the sad thing about security. I mean, you could live like that, but, I mean, try to get some work done. <laughs> I mean, you're going to, you know, I don't know. It just kind of depends on where you're at. Like, when I was in the yep. military, mm -hmm. yeah, something like that, I might have treated a lot different, you know. But that's because of the sensitivity. Of some of the in the military, they might have epoxy gluing the keyboard to the computer, right? I mean, you just cannot physically disconnect it. Yeah. So, well, no, I, mean, I used to carry. manufacturer without USB ports at all. Mm -hmm. Give custom order. Uh, just a couple healthcare companies, local healthcare companies that do that. They get their product with no USB ports on it at all. Yep. Yeah. 
I mean, they take stuff pretty seriously. Like, I used to take uh, hard drives for destruction. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like funny. It's like the first time I went to go do it, and they actually gave me a suitcase, and I was like, "Are you freaking kidding me?" And they're like, "No, here's the handcuffs." Like, and then you have to go with a buddy because it's two person integrity, just to make sure I ain't gonna drive off somewhere. And <laughs> yeah, usually the buddy has the gun, right? Cut it, and no, you know, it's funny because it depends. Case. There's different scenarios when you have to be. Armed. And they didn't There's tell you this, but you were actually the decoy. <laughs> 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 The, the real thing was sent by UPS. Oh, I mean, they, they like concepts like this, right? I mean, you, know, yeah. you are the decoy, you have the bright orange, you know, pelican case <laughs> that is padlocked, handcuffed to you, and your partner has, you know, the gun, right? Yeah. And then the actual package is an, in a very unsuspicious package sent by UPS to the destination. <laughs> yeah. Very Basically, you say, "Look at me! I got the stuff," you know. But the actual stuff is somewhere else. Yeah. Yep. You you had a point yeah, to make. You just described how you how they got that virus in the in that nuclear plant. The key logger would have been that would have given them access, uh, administrator access, if they could have got the administrator to use their system. It's hard to say. I don't think they have anything conclusive, you know. But I think you know. Okay, just to relate to what we talked about. I think the group Anonymous you know, has announced that they have gotten their hands on the, the Stuxnet virus. Uh, yeah. He said it was written in Hebrew, so I'll give you one guess where it came from. But it's, it's some serious you know, work, though. I mean, to have three zero day exploits and have to go through all the trouble to infect not just the host computer, but also the individual PLCs or the bricks, you know, yeah. to control a nuclear plant. That's a lot of work. Okay. Well, I, mean, I think a lot of this too is <coughs> exponential brain power. I mean, a long time ago, you heard of one guy mm -hmm. breaking a lot, you know, just causing all kinds of chaos. Yeah, and I don't really think that's not really the case anymore. Because I mean, it's, yeah, maybe he finds out one exploit, but to do some damage with it, he needs information from somebody else. So you know, you've got to have people working in groups. You know, mm -hmm. Just like programmers do, right? Programmers work in groups. Well, you know, but 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 these days, you know, these groups are called countries. Yeah. yeah no, exactly. No, exactly. Right. Like they say, like, well, where's all this fake counterfeit money coming from? And they're like, well, there's no way this could have been funded by a private party. And it's nope. like, well, but who else could come up with that kind of money? And they're like, oh, a state could come up with that kind of money. Oh yeah. And then you realize, like, okay, well, we're not dealing with like petty thieves anymore. We're dealing with state-funded programs to print counterfeit money. And, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I know, you know, this is this may not be the best place to talk about it, but you know, Larry, me, and Bob, you know, we kind of some, you know, we, we sit in Bob's office and you know, just kind of chit chatted, and one day, you know, I told him, you know, the new Al Qaeda may not be the same Al Qaeda as you know we know it anymore. You can have Al Qaeda, you know, being a hacker, you know, in front of a computer doing this all day long, instead of you know someone who's putting bombs together and stuff like that because. You can do more damage doing this if you know what they, what you're doing. Yeah. You know because it, it's. You make more money than you get with those coaches. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. loggers don't even have to be in the same room as a computer anymore. They actually, I saw a thing on I think it's somebody at MIT or someplace like that. They actually have an antenna Acoustic. on the other side of the wall, and they get the signals from the keyboard. Oh right, right. Yeah, they can intercept the. Yeah, they can intercept the interference. The defense against that is you—you you just you know emulate you know a lot of keystrokes that are just random and noise. <laughs> you just you just throw out so many million keystrokes that you know it's it's it's, it's not traceable. The signal is lost in the noise. Yeah, just paint your walls with that anti. Wi-Fi Yeah, Faraday Cage. So are we doing okay so far with those concepts? Okay, Clam AV, okay, the Clam FS, and also GPG are your lessons for this week. Yep. On your video and here in my practice, I'm finding that to create a gen, uh, key pair, I need more random bytes. How do you propose we generate random bytes from the video? Ah, uh, <laughs> I don't recall the video right at this moment, so it's in the thing that says you install GPM. I did install GPM. Go back to your the VM. Uh -huh. They'll be running at the VM, most likely not in the putty session. You can still run it in putty, I think. Yeah, but you have to you have to log back in with it. Well, according to the instructions, back. they have you go in through putty as the user to generate the key yeah, pair. I, well, that's what I'm saying. I had to go through the the VM. Okay, 
console. Yeah, so install that. What was the mouse thing called? Didn't you use the mouse to do it? Yeah, GPM. Yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. 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 Mm -mm. It's an encryption software that's a version of it for Linux. And when you're going to generate the key, they tell you to move your mouse around and start tapping uh -huh. the keyboard for generate the random. I think I got that to you know when I use um, the key pair generator for my cell phone. Uh, it asked me to just you know do random patterns on the touchpad. But at a quantum at a quantum level, everything is random. I guess the, the lecture part is officially done. Let me turn off the recorder. Are you going to take a few minutes for Sorry? Attendance? No, not